see. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Taryn McKenna, and I'll be moderating Building a Culture of Open Source Contribution this morning with your presenters, Elizabeth McKinney from Pines, Carl D'Amelia from Bibliomation, and Kathy Lucier from Noble. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Equinox for the platform sponsorship, ECDI for captioning, and Kipu for the Thursday Hackfest. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat. I will be monitoring excuse me, both the feed loop and the Zoom chat so you can ask questions in either one. And um, I can relay those to the presenters. Uh, the session will be recorded and I will post the captioning link in the chat in just a moment as well. With that, I'm going to stop my screen share and let's see if it'll let me. <laughs> it doesn't let me. There we go. And turn it over to uh, Kathy, Elizabeth, and Carl. I can't screen share. You should be able to let's see. This is a disabled participant screen sharing. I think mm. I need to be made a co-host or something, maybe. Um okay, let me check the host tools. Okay, try now. That worked. Thank okay. you. And oh goodness. Do you see the actual presentation? It says building a culture of open source contribution. Yes, you're good. Okay. Good, because I lost the screen. Um, sorry. Good morning. So I, I'll kick things off here. I'm Kathy Lucier from uh, Noble. Um, we're going to do this. Uh, we, we have some slides, but I think our hope is that we make this more of a discussion than an actual presentation. And um, we weren't planning to present for the full hour in the hopes that we can have some kind of presentation. So I hope a lot of you feel comfortable unmuting your microphone later on or maybe putting things into chat so that you can put, be part of the conversation too. Um, but this is, uh, um, I pulled this group together because as many of you know, it's very important to me to see that um, organizations in the Evergreen community that uh, are really actively contributing to the projects. And um, I reached out to Elizabeth and Carl because I've found over the years that Georgia Pines and Bibliomation consistently have had um, staff who contribute to the project in many different aspects. And even as staff has turned over, that's always remained true. So I thought they could have some um, tips to share too. So with that, we're just going to dive into some questions uh, to get us started. And like I said, we're going to talk about our experiences. And then I hope to hear a little bit about your experiences at your libraries. So and the reason I didn't have Elizabeth introduce herself is because that is going to be uh, part of the first slide. So I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth. Um, and what we're first going to talk about is who we are and how our consortia came to open source and evergreen. So go ahead, Elizabeth. So I'm Elizabeth McKinney, the director of Pines. And um, our uh, history with open source and evergreen uh, began back in 2003, 2004. Um, the Pines Consortium hit some of the limits on the vendor-based software that we were using. And, um, and we also, uh, in 1999, had subscribed and invested a lot of money into the acquisitions module of this uh, vendor-based product. And um, around the 2003-2004 timeframe, uh, one of the developers uh, from that vendor said, as long as I work here, it will never work like that. So... Um, you know, we had invested so much into it, and we realized that we really needed to look elsewhere. After a vendor place marketplace, a vendor marketplace survey, we realized that we didn't have any good options. And uh, Julie Walker, who is now our state librarian, was the director of Pines at the time. And uh, that uh, statement about the acquisitions module really opened her eyes up to the fact that uh, we really did need to keep keep ourselves open to what was possible. And um, then I'll, I'll never forget like one of our last uh, vendor meetings, <laughs> the, the uh, Brad Lejeunesse, who was the, the person who had the idea to go open source, it was over in the corner whispering, open source, open source. And so we had to really uh, step back and take a look at that. And then that's 
when we decide, well, we did take a look at Koha. We weren't just being completely irrational. We took a look at Koha, but it wouldn't scale for our needs. So that's when we started development on Evergreen. And even from the very beginning, we knew that open source was the only way to go just because it wasn't sustainable to develop our own product. We knew that it had to be something. And then uh, we also worked very hard to uh, involve the community. People were very open, very curious about what the heck a state library agency was doing, developing software, which it was not necessarily the hotbed of innovation that <laughs> you would, well, you, you would not imagine. So um, we were very fortunate to have a lot of really uh, great um, contributors and partners from the very beginning. And uh, it turned out that in 2007, just after we went live with Evergreen, um, some vendors made what I would just say some very tragic decisions that opened the really the, the whole community up. And I think there are several people here that were part of that group of people who did start looking at Evergreen at that time. So that's how we arrived here. Sorry, I lost the mute button there. Did Carl arrive? Does anyone know? Because I was going to hand it over to him next. Sorry, I'm trying to pull up the... It's not behaving. Okay, well, um, I will, if you want to look at that, I'll dive into uh, how Noble got involved, how we came to... Uh... Carl did just arrive. Thanks, Ruth. Okay. And um, I started moving forward. Carl, are you there? Kyle, if you're talking, you're muted right now. So, I don't, Kathy, did you want to go ahead and answer and then let Carl loop back in yeah, as he gets sure. everything gets settled? <laughs> All right. So, um, and uh, I just started at Noble back in July, but I happened to be around uh, and working with Noble when they first moved to Evergreen. So I have a lot of the information on how they came to Evergreen. And um, I would say there was a bit of frustration um, from Noble about the amount of money they were spending with their vendor and the fact that they didn't have much power over what new features could be there, what bugs could be fixed, things like that. Um, and they were just in a position where if libraries were complaining about something, all they could do was tell them, yeah, we submitted it to the user group, we're advocating for it, but they couldn't do much more than that. So, so that was a big part of the reason why they went to open source. Uh, and this was back in 2009. So at that time, there were two other consortia in Massachusetts that was that were thinking about moving to open source. So the three consortia decided to work together and to apply for an LSTA grant to um, fund their move to open source. And the LSTA grant included funds for a project coordinator to help them all move. And that ended up being me. Um, and they also... Um, it also included funds to uh, do development in whatever uh, software that was chosen um, so that to make it ready for Massachusetts libraries, because at the time, I think the state was hoping more consortia would be moving to an open source system because of the you know, potential cost savings. And then the state wasn't wouldn't have to put so much money into grants for these consortia that were using systems that were getting more expensive. So uh, it was a group effort. Um, I would say each person who, uh, each consortium who that actually was part of this grant had different reasons for why they wanted to move to open source. But in the case of Noble, I think a lot of it had to do with having control over the software that they used and also having control over the costs. We, we don't like to use the term that it's less expensive. We like to say that we have more control over costs so that if you, there's a year when budgets are tight, you may not put as much into development as other years, but it, that decision is in your control. 
And then specifically how Noble came to Evergreen is the three consortia looked and they had three criteria, scalability, um, extendability, which is working with third party vendors. And then this thing they called multiness, which is having libraries be unique and have their individual settings. Um, and as we've participated in the community, especially the multiness factor, you'll see a lot of the things we advocate for are based on those three criteria, which continue to be important for us today. And Carl, did you want to talk about how Bibliomation? Sure, came? thank you. Sorry for being late. Uh, <laughs> we're doing interviews today and I'm kind of in between. So, um, so uh, again, around 2009 to 2011, the organization was really looking to uh, move away from a traditional ILS vendor. Uh, all sorts of things had happened and it was just uh, the organization needed to move. And fortunately, uh, at that time, uh, COHA uh, became available and staff uh, kicked the tires and tested it uh, and tried it out with some of our select members who wanted to try it out. Uh, and, you know, while it's a good product, it's really good for uh, individual libraries and not so much for consortia. And so Evergreen was developed by Pines and uh, staff here decided that they wanted to look at it to see if it was appropriate. And after testing um, in-house, uh, they recruited, I believe six smaller libraries in Connecticut who in exchange for becoming members would become uh, basically the test ground for Evergreen. And over that, whatever number of months uh, of testing, uh, it showed itself to be a really good product for uh, consortia. Uh, and so then the decision was made to move to Evergreen in 2011. And at that time, uh, the board and members uh, and staff felt really strongly about the, the I think one of the, the touchstones of, of, of open source is that um, you know, the sense of community and contributing to community. And I think that um, is a really strong uh, influence on why and why we did move and why we continue to use Evergreen. Um, it's worked out really well for us. Uh, I know that it really shown you know, we always knew that we had control of the software and we can do all sorts of customization uh, and contribute to the community. But where Evergreen really showed uh, its promise was during COVID, uh, our member libraries asked us to do all sorts of policy changes. And instead of waiting for, a, a, you know, another vendor to get tickets and maybe decide to do something or not, our staff was able to very skillfully make those changes so that our libraries would continue to function. Um, and I think that was something that was amazing, amazing to me and amazing to some of our member libraries. Uh, of course, staff had to go back and put everything back the way it was before, but um, you know, we were able to help our libraries because we had that local control over the code and policies. I think I'm going to keep myself unmuted because my bar keeps disappearing. Um, uh, Carl, uh, I'm going to have you continue if you want to talk about oh, sure. um, how you think um, contributions for your staff actually benefit your organization. So sure. why is it important for Biblio Nation to have their employees contribute to the project? Well, I, I think it, it, it affects us on a variety of levels, <clears throat> but it, you know, participation, we participate at, from the beginning at every level, whether it's the board, governance, uh, development, projects, testing, documentation, you know, our involvement is uh, broad. Uh, and we like to uh, be able to, to actually participate. It's something we believe in with open source. Uh, and I think we get a lot out of it uh, because we help to contribute to the future of everything, right? Um, you know, we bring not only our ideas for development that we may have 
uh, called from our members uh, because we certainly do try to get their input. Uh, but you know, staff who work on the with the software all the time will see where things may need to be changed or ask that things changed. Um, so determining the future of the, the ILS is really important to us because again, going back to working with traditional vendors, um, I would say that not necessarily, the emphasis isn't necessarily put on uh, what the members or users want. Uh, whereas with Evergreen and open source, uh, we have a much more kind of direct uh, impact uh, over time. Uh, you know, we, we allow staff to participate. Uh, this has continued, you know, through the 11 years that we've had uh, Evergreen. Um, even though we've had staff turnover here and there, uh, the new people who come in are inculcated with this uh, enthusiasm to participate and contribute as much as they can once they know the system. Um, and this participation at the bottom, the bottom line is I think it helps uh, staff learn their job, learn evergreen and perform their jobs better and also increase uh, the level of support to our member libraries. Elizabeth, do you have anything to add to that for your organization? Yes, I would certainly echo everything that uh, Carl said. Um, I think the overarching theme I would uh, say is that we all benefit um, from our contributions to the uh, to the community because we're able to leverage the cost of development. And we're able to, you know, that uh, du the duplication of effort, we're able to le leverage that because, you know, we're, we're all working together towards uh, uh, making every, the software better. Um, locally, um, I think we benefit uh, because, and this is just one example of how uh, we, we work within the Pines community, is if we see heat added to something that's going to be, you know, either fixed or developed, um, we can wait either wait to participate in a community effort and if we don't see heat being added and it's something that our libraries really want, then we're able to prioritize our own uh, Pines list of developments. And, and this is where I'll add the disclaimer that Taryn and Chris and everyone can just add, add and, uh, as, as they see fit. But that's really um, uh, how I think we benefit both locally and uh, globally. Yeah, and it, I had a long list here too, and I'm gonna try to pick on of some things that haven't been said yet, but I agree with everything that Carl and Elizabeth already said. Um, as far as, you know, really learning the software, having a deeper understanding of the software, Carl mentioned that's definitely a, a piece of it. The more you contribute, the better you understand the software and the better you can support your libraries. But there's also other kinds of on-the-job training that comes out of being part of the community that, you know, it's, it's like free on-the-job training for your staff. There's, you know, the leadership qualities you get from being in the community, the communication skills that you need to be able to interact with the community, the, the teamwork, and all of that comes back to this organization too. Mm -hmm. um, another big piece is um, the more the, the custom things we like to do for our system, the more we can actually put that into the community code, the less work for our upgrades. Um, and that's something we've been working on a lot, a lot where, um, you know, we have some custom things that our libraries love and we're really trying to do, put more of those into the software itself so that the next upgrade, it's not one more thing we have to send to our host saying, okay, make sure you get this added and, and it becomes easier. Um, and those of you who saw the list maker presentation yesterday, that's a little bit different because it isn't affected by an upgrade, but we definitely see that if it's out there in the community, then more people can take a look at it and improve it in their own way and make it better for us too. Um, and, you know, another thing that uh, 
it's just, I think it helps with morale among staff to keep them challenged um, working in a community like this. And, and it makes them happy. I, I know when I first came on board here and I talked to individual staff members, that's one thing that came up among a lot of the staff was they wanted to be able to participate in the community more. And you want to make your staff happy because they're going to, you know, be happier about working and doing what they do best. So it, it really... A lot of benefits come out of doing that. I agree. Did either of you have anything else you wanted to add before we go on to the next piece that came to mind? Okay, I, I'm going to dive in to start off on the next one. Okay. Uh, so this is um, maybe measures that we may have put in place to encourage active community participation. And actually, this is something that has been one of the most fun parts of my job since being at Noble is when I was at MassLink, I always talked to libraries about how they needed to encourage their staff to participate. And I'm finally in a position where, you know, I can start trying to do things to, to get my staff to participate. And really, it's not like they couldn't contribute before because Ron Geignan, my predecessor, was always a big believer in, you know, contributing to the community. So it, it really lay down good groundwork there. One of the things I've been trying to focus on, though, is um, what I call consistent and meaningful contributions to the community. Um, so, and I think on a community level, I've been thinking a lot about how do we build more consistency in the contributions that are made and the activity that mm -hmm. happens. Um, so a, a lot of the things we do at a community level, which are great. Um, so for example, the bug squashing weeks and the feedback fest. And I'm just gonna take this opportunity to mention that on August 14th, 14th or 24th, something in, the, in August, we're going to have the 10th anniversary of our first bug squashing day because it was a bug squashing day back then. And um, I remember when we uh, started it, um, I was a little disappointed in the amount of activity we had for that first event. I'm going to put a chat in uh, a link into the chat that um, was the uh, blog post from our first bug squashing event. Um, but it was like there were 17 participants, the number of patches that were merged, I was hoping for this huge number of bug fixes going in. It didn't happen that way, but you know, under Taryn's leadership, they've really taken off and um, with the full week and, and we see a lot more activity. Um, so those are great events, the feedback fasts are great, but I think where the challenge is, is when you are focusing on these specific moments in time, you know, somebody tests a patch, they have feedback for the patch saying, oh, this one thing didn't work. Maybe the developer can work on it during bug squashing week. By the time they post it, it's the end of the week. And then if you're not still working on commuting things, then when does it get tested next? And maybe it sits there for a while. And by the time we can get it, we, we're ready to test it, it needs to um, be rebased, which, you know, but maybe the developer's not ready to rebase it. So sometimes that's where we can see some delays in our coding. So I really am trying to see if there's a way we could have more balance between these big events and consistency. So um, one of, you know, the f things we're doing here is as part of their job goals, the people on the Evergreen team have at least one goal that pertains to making some kind of community contribution. And when I say community in this respect, I'm not just talking about the Evergreen community. It could be the Massachusetts Library community because there are other things we can contribute to. But for most of the Evergreen team, it means the Evergreen community. Um, so, and I think what this helps is it really, helps them think about how they want to contribute to the community and articulate in, what, in some way how they want to support the community um, so that the contributions maybe are a little bit more meaningful. Um, the other thing we've done is we say, you know, try to spend 10% of your work hours on community work. So what this kind of goes uh, ends up being is a half day a week, um, 45 minutes per day, two full days per month, uh, whatever breakdown helps them manage the time better. Um, you know, it, it could be the way, but really two days per month 
isn't a huge amount of time to have people work on community things. Um, let me see. And I think what this does is it gives them a feeling of permission to prioritize community work. And like I said, it wasn't as if they didn't feel like they contrib could contribute to the community before, but you're always trying to balance what you do for the community and what you're trying to do for your libraries. And this gives them the freedom to say, okay, well, I haven't done much community work. I can prioritize this over maybe some other thing they may have been working on that day and make them, you know, understand that this is important for our organization. Um, and then, of course, another thing was just letting them take off with their own ideas. So a few months ago, our uh, core committer on staff, Michelle Morgan, came up the, with the idea of doing these things called get going sessions. Um, so there you get you, basically you get going with Git. Um, so it'll be just a couple of hours every once in a while where anyone on staff who wants to learn more about how to use Git, she just works with them on it. And I know the first time they did it, someone got food for it and, um, you know, made it into a little event. And I had nothing to do with that. I just heard that they were doing it and said, great, that sounds exciting. Uh, and, and basically, what I'm hoping to do is really take some of the traits of an open source community and build them into our organizational culture. And I'm going to share a link in chat um, that was an article, a blog post I came across that really talks about you know, building an organiz uh, open source organizational culture, but it really is trying to, you know, take these things that are important in the evergreen community, collaboration, automation, consistent process and consistent feedback, um, particularly consistent feedback. Um, we're doing uh, weekly check-ins with our direct reports here so that we were constantly talking to them, not overseeing them, but talking to them about what they're working on and trying to um, help them with it. Um, shared responsibility for the organization, all of those things we do in the community, trying to bring that to our work culture too. Um, so it, it's been a lot of fun, I would say. Um, Elizabeth, I'm gonna pass this one on to you now. Okay, um, so um, in Pines, we, we have kind of a three-tiered approach uh, to encourage um, engagement. Um, and, and of course, then the Pines team, the, the folks that work at the Georgia Public Library Service, you know, 40 hours a week <laughs> to, for the purpose of supporting Pines. And then we have our library staff, which are the 2,500 people who work at public libraries across the state of Georgia. And then we have all of our library patrons across the state. So within the Pines team, that was just built into our culture. Um, you know, it was just a, a natural part of our agency. You know, it's by default. Um, we're the ones that started development on Evergreen, and that included the folks that spun off um, Equinox, um, Mike Rylander, Bill Erickson, Jason Etheridge. Um, so you know, can, and we knew that we couldn't do it on our own from the beginning. So we've always had that mindset of welcoming others and collaborating. So um, that, that it's just a natural and easy part of, of how we work. Uh, officially on the job description, uh, there is a requirement of 10% of your time to, to participate in the community. But, uh, and I hate, I hate to be just such a name dropper today, but uh, Chris Sharp, Taryn McKenna, Tiffany Little, Don Dale, Susan Morrison, and Stephen Mayo. So Stephen's our most recent, so you may, he might not be as well known, but y'all know that those people spend more than any four hours a week <laughs> working in the community. So, uh, and that and that's fine because when we go back to, you know, how it benefits our organization, yes, in participation in the community benefits us immensely. So, so it doesn't matter if they're spending four or, you know, 39 hours per week working in the community, uh, then, then that's just, that's just what it takes. Um, so I think the 10% is just something that we have to have on file downtown for the purpose of um, those annual performance reviews. So they all definitely exceed that, <laughs> that element. Um, we do encourage uh, the library staff throughout the state uh, to participate. That one's a little bit more difficult. And I hate to jump into the slide where we're talking about any challenges, but uh, you know, uh, their time is not our own. So we, we uh, 
you know, they have various things that they need to work on, but we do encourage their participation. And Taryn is excellent at uh, notifying people when there's going to be a community event like uh, bug squashing or the new developers group. Uh, we do offer scholarships to the conference when it's when it's financially feasible. Uh, you know, being a you know state library agency, we can't afford to send everyone to Vancouver as much as we would like to. Like where that's where we had the conference one year, but when I, when we had it in North Carolina, we had a, a whole slew of people that we provided scholarships to attend the conference. Um, and one of the I guess more subtle ways that they participate is through our uh, Pine subcommittees. So when there's anything that has to do with software development or things like that, then Taryn also hosts those discussions uh, and votes by email. This is all conducted by email then to decide, you know, you know, are we going to roll out this new feature? Or are we going to do that? And then and that's a way that she helps uh, folks to uh, participate in the, in the larger community. Um, and the last way, um, and it's not you know, the least is our annual patron satisfaction survey, also <laughs> conducted by Taryn once a year. And we get feedback on that survey uh, through set questions and through open-ended questions that definitely uh, that feedback helps drive decisions within the consortium. You know, whether we're going to, you know, put something um, on the uh, the bug list with the community or if it's something that we're going to try to, you know, handle on, on the local level and then feedback to the community, then that is something that has definitely driven many decisions that we've made in Pines. Carl? So, so for add? us, I mean, I agree with everything Elizabeth and Kathy have said. Um, for us, we don't have a formal, anything formal set up. Um, I think a lot of it has to do to the individual uh, initiative and motivation of our staff. Um, who come to their positions as people who, as professionals, who really want to uh, contribute. Um, so certainly as they become more familiar with the software, uh, you know, they reach out uh, to various entities to, to ask questions, to learn more. Uh, and then as they, they learn the software, uh, they become the people who are asked those questions. Uh, Again, I mean, kind of reinforce what I said in the previous question is that, you know, staff realize the importance of being active uh, and being a voice uh, for members uh, in the development of Evergreen. Um, we do, uh, we try to do an annual survey of member libraries uh, to see what they like and they don't like and if they have suggestions for uh, improvements. Uh, we have committees uh, that do the same thing. Plus, you know, if we're developing something, we go through our committees to do beta testing. Um, so while it's not formal, I think there's just kind of a built-in um, motivation on on the part of our staff to to tr try to do something or leave something uh, in a better place, uh, and they work to those goals. Well, a question I have for both of you, because I haven't I'm found myself in this position yet, but I will be soon, is when you're hiring, is that something that you keep in mind if it, they seem to have a passion for open source, it seem like they would have that kind of enthusiasm that would drive them to do that as much con contributing as they do? I mean, for me, when we're interviewing, uh... I think it's a fair question to ask, you know, what do they know about open source? Have they ever used it? Uh, what would their feelings be in learning it, using it? Um, how do they feel about, you know, because open source is a community and there's a lot of uh, input required, you know, would they be comfortable with doing that type of thing? Um, you can also see on, on their resumes too, if they've been active in professional organizations, like the Connecticut Library Association or, or New England Library Association or whatever. Uh, so you get a sense that uh, in, this person may be somebody who, who automatically participates and that's an interest for them. And in um, with Pines, we, we do include questions on every interview about 
open source and evergreen you know whether they have any experience with either and sometimes that question the answer about open source can be very <laughs> telling <laughs> and then another thing that we look at um, in in interviewing a candidate is just a, the, a, having a natural curiosity and being very self-driven because mm -hmm. I think that that is something that you need in order to be a successful member of the community yeah I agree with that absolutely and I like the link you did Carl with the uh professional associations because you know as an active member of the Massachusetts Library Association I, I do see a lot of the way I work within that association is similar to how I work with the community so it, it mm -hmm. definitely is equal you know same yeah. skill sets there all right this is our final question and Elizabeth why don't you get us started uh with any challenges you've seen in getting people to participate, community participation. Right, I think the biggest challenge uh, to us in having people um, participate is within the library staff, those 2,500 library staff across the state, because as I mentioned previously, um, their time is not ours um, and they have limited time and in public libraries uh, when we serve, um, they have limited staff, limited funds and many, many challenges um, especially in the last several years. So um, it, that, that's that's the biggest the, the biggest challenge. And of course, you know, I mentioned that um, Taryn does continue to encourage folks to participate. Uh, Tiffany involves folks in the cataloging groups. Um, so that that's I think that would be our single single most uh, single biggest challenge to participation. Carl, does Bibliomation have any challenges? <laughs> well, challenges related to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, for this one, I had to go to my staff, my Evergreen staff, and ask them what they saw. Uh, time is the biggest challenge for them uh, and also for participation from member libraries. Uh, ever since COVID, I think it's, I think everybody sees this. It's really hard to get people from outside of, you know, we have our, our staff and they can manipulate their schedules to do whatever they need to do. Uh, but it's really difficult on any level to get members for a variety of reasons to participate on the board or, or uh, you know, committees or subcommittees. It's really difficult, but um, staff said that the time is probably the biggest challenge. Um, they also noted uh, they felt that it was hard for new members to figure out where to start with Evergreen. Uh, and then on to that, they said onboarding can be a struggle. Uh, and then they also said that there's no simple way to set up testing, a testing environment, and the testing environment requires a certain amount of skill. Uh, and then lastly, they told me that uh, coordinating with other community members to work on bugs can be difficult. So those are the things that Jessica and Gina uh, provided, um, you know, as what they saw as the most challenging. So in our case, and I went to my staff too, because, you know, some of these measures we put into place are just, I don't even think they've been in place for six months. So this is all um, a new approach um, just to find out if it, you know, any of this has been helpful. And there was a sense, you know, a feeling a little more free to contribute to things that may not directly impact Noble. So that was a, a good thing where, you know, I'm trying to emphasize that if it helps Evergreen, then it helps Noble, even if mm -hmm. it may not be of particular importance to us. So so that was good to hear, but definitely the same thing Carl said about time being a, a factor. Um, so, you know, I think that's where the where I was talking about the consistent feedback being important so that, you know, when we have our weekly check-ins, we can talk about, okay, where are some, you know, places we can free up that time or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe have some time where, someone else is handling support questions so that for a block of time so that you can focus on this. So, you know, that's kind of a next step we might be looking at. Um, and and, the, and Carl mentioned this too, just being able to find some of those tasks. And I, I think this is coming from me that I've been trying to 
you know, because of my involvement in the community, whenever I'm hearing about something, um, trying to think, oh, well, is there a way that my staff can help with this? So, you know, and, and trying to think outside those specific functional areas where they're likely to um, participate and, you know, maybe is there something in the outreach committee that they could do or um, maybe with community infrastructure like the Google Workspace, you know, that we have now that the, we have a workspace account that we administrate or other ways we can help with that. So, and these are all things that we aren't doing. I'm just, you know, these are the kind of things that are going through my mind. Mm -hmm. And just thinking that it would be helpful just if we had a place where we could put up, this is where we need help and that people could go to. But I, I think DIG has done that in the past and with varying levels of success. Um, you know, I was um, talking to Jane Sandberg uh, before this session because she was wishing she could be here for it. And, you know, what's interesting about Jane is she works at Princeton and um, she does all of this. They don't use Evergreen and she does all of this community time. And they also have that 10%. You can use 10% of your time to contribute to open source and for them it doesn't matter what um open source project it is it doesn't matter that she's working on evergreen even though they don't use evergreen um and, and she was also talking about um how her supervisor will regularly check in with her to you know see if she's able to contribute as much as she would like to and if not that her supervisor tries to work around that which i just think is you know awesome that this library does this um because uh, she's so valuable to the community um so, so that was interesting to hear um both the 10 percent number and you know the fact the regular check-ins that you know some of the ways i'm hoping to work with challenges or things that they're doing there um and she also said that just contributing to open source is just really celebrated in general there which was good you know something interesting to hear just really talking it up and making it a wonderful thing to do. So at this point, we've got about 20 minutes left and I am, I just, I'm putting up the slide, tell us your stories, but I'm gonna stop sharing because I wanna look at people. Um, <laughs> I really hate not being able to see people. And I just wanted to, we wanted to open it up and hear what you all do are there different things you're doing at your libraries or staff people are there things you wish your organizations would do to support uh your involvement in the community so i'm gonna give a little shout out for ecdi uh that has been a, a great boon for evergreen indiana um we have, well, currently, we, generally speaking, we have one person that is on the admin team that represents the consortium, but the rest of the people who participate are from member libraries. Uh, and uh, we actively um, court people uh, in terms of testing and things like that. The other thing that, that I have tried to be um, Well, I, I would not say that I've been terribly consistent about it, but I've tried to try to be, is to promote the interest groups as a way for people to um, go outside of Indiana, network with people, other users from around the world, um, using things like cataloging acquisitions. Maybe they get tied into uh, Dig or the New Permissions Working Group. Uh, just so that they have a realization that this is bigger than us and that also that, um, that their voices matter, not just within Indiana, not just for Evergreen Indiana, but broadly. Um, and, and then we celebrate when they're, they're able to contribute as well. Uh, I don't think that we have had um, as broad-based involvement, definitely not as much as I would like. And um, I think we have some organizational um, structure issues that, that sometimes get in the way of that. Uh, and I'm hoping that those can kind of be addressed for my 
for and perhaps by my successor. Uh, but we have, Evergreen is well loved in Indiana, especially, especially by our members. And there, we also have enthusiasts outside um, and the idea being that we can work collaboratively and that people can get involved, whether or not they have the time to do so is another thing um, and whether they're empowered by their admins. But there is this belief um, that is real that they can be if they are otherwise empowered to do so. So We have a couple of questions in chat. The first is from Simone. Any recommendations on ways that smaller consortiums with smaller libraries and little to no management centralization can develop ways to contribute to Evergreen? And I'm going to say that this question really is for consortia. I mean, there's different ways you can say small consortia. I'm going to say small in terms of staffing because Noble is a small consortium in terms of number of libraries, but I wouldn't say we're small um, compared to other evergreen consortia in terms of the staffing we have. Um, and then I'm going to say the one suggestion I would have is to start with one of the bigger events like Bug Squashing Week or Feedback Fest, but I'm going to leave that question there if anyone else has thoughts. Bug Squashing Week is a really ent easy entry level to anything uh, any community participation, in my opinion. The, uh, I saw that Taryn put in a, a plug for that earlier. So Taryn, if you want to re reiterate that at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. Um, uh, everyone at all levels, uh, not just developers. In fact, it's almost important for non-developers to get involved in Bug Squashing Week and Feedback Fest. We use the terms Bug Squashing Week and Feedback Fest as Bug Squashing Week is more focused on testing um, bugs and proposed fixes and new features and Feedback Fest is more focused on making sure that the upcoming release doesn't have any new bugs that are introduced and that all of the new features in the upcoming release are uh, working properly. Um, but we do, they, there's a lot of crossover between the two. Um, the link is in the chat. And um, I always, uh, if you're not, um, subscribe to the Evergreen General mailing list. Um, please do subscribe. Um, we send out notices when the next one is coming out. Um, the document a documentation interest group is another one for people that don't have a developer background um, that always needs additional um, support. If you understand how to use the software, or if you're you know even learning how to use the software, you can always contribute to documentation. So I'd recommend that one. Um, there is another question too I wanted to get to be since, to make sure we get to everything. Uh, do you have a process for agreeing on preference when staff respond to a launchpad bug? For example, that should be a library setting or how something should work. Can you repeat that question again? Sure, uh, this question is from Joan. Uh, do you have a process for agreeing on preference when staff respond to a launchpad bug, for example, that should be a library setting or how something should work. So I think she's, if I'm interpreting it correctly, I think she's asking, do you have an internal uh, process for when your staff should respond and how they should respond to launchpad bugs? I, so, um, and this is something I inherited coming in here. We do have uh, what we call evergreen meetings twice a week where our evergreen staff get together to talk about what we're working on. And if there's a lunch pad bug of interest, we talk about it as a group to get that, to figure out that feedback. And, you know, sometimes the feedback really needs library staff um, uh, feedback. In the, uh, a lot of times we know our libraries well enough to know what it should be, but sometimes it may be part um brought up during a some kind of circulation uh, discussion group meeting if we need to get beyond that. I don't know what other people have because I know doing two evergreen meetings a week might be a lot for some people. If you're talking about responding to launch pad tickets, um, we don't. 
Um, ours is if you have the wherewithal to go into Launchpad um, and you have an opinion um, because Evergreen is an open uh, project that people replying should be able to reply um, as their own selves, somebody that's invested in the, the Evergreen community. Um, and and that, that's kind of always, maybe that is out of my own belief that it was the standard before um, I came as well as an administrator, so. Yeah, in our case, it, it isn't so much that we're worried about people expressing a wrong, expressing their opinion, but it's more mm -hmm. trying to figure out well, what would work best for our consortium. Right. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It's more for like a collaborative thing. We do well and when I was we thinking, troubleshoot together. I was really thinking done. more too in terms of um, our member libraries that may um, be getting into Launchpad, which we completely encourage. Um, and we don't have that same collaboration that we might have with the admin team. Now, if they ask us, of course, we're gonna be working with them and in those types of things, but there's such a, a vast um, difference between people who are just uh, learning what even Launchpad is and people who are long time um, members in Evergreen, Indiana and the, the Evergreen community as well. I want to plug Bug Squash Week too for, for end users for a specific reason. I know several people have said that, but um, I know that there was a very legitimate comment of having like continual contribution um, outside of that as well. But for, and, and that is that, yes, that too. But for a lot of our end user librarians and things, having something on the schedule, it makes their participation um, much more um, likely because they can just like a conference block it out and say, this is, this is what I'm doing. I'm gonna, for these two hours, gonna be working for Bug Squash Week or these four hours, so, and it's fun. I'll add that in Pines, um, most of our uh, library users are not comfortable in Launchpad either, um, but they do use our help desk um, to send in suggestions and bug reports. And so our team will often either find an existing bug for that or add a wish list or a new bug um, into Launchpad for them. And if there's an existing bug already, we'll often ask, you know, suggest to them that they add heat to it, which is just a matter of logging in and clicking a little button says, yes, this, uh, this affects me too. And that prior, helps prior to prioritize those bugs for the developers. And that's a very low bar, uh, not intimidating way to contribute. I, I wanna bring up one other low bar thing that hasn't been mentioned or chat or talk or in the discussion. Um, just being signed up for lists and when people are looking for feedback, sending an email and giving your feedback. I mean, that's really low bar of not a lot of time other than reading the emails and giving it some thought. Hey, this is Gina. Um, just wanted to make kind of like a off shoot of a comment. Um, and this actually goes well into Hackfest for tomorrow. Um, I'm wondering, just because uh, this whole idea of like how hard it is to onboard people to this uh, open source project, I know that's been like a kind of like an ongoing uh, obstacle for us is um, maybe DIG and as someone talking as a DIG member, um, maybe we can do some things to uh, kind of offset it. Like I know that videos are not typically like what we do uh, or tutorials or something like that, but it, it has made me think like, maybe we should consider doing projects like that. Like, you know, I, I know that we have like a bunch of um, webinars uh, on like an intro to Launchpad, uh, but maybe something that's like a bit more tutorial based could be potentially helpful, just a thought. 
I would yeah, like to, to incorporate. Oh, sorry. Uh, just to jump in on that, I, when we first started collecting videos, um, it was sort of an outreach and dig. So we sent some stuff out and, and um, asked for documentation videos, but we haven't really done much with that since last year. <laughs> so, Do you want to add that as like a topic for tomorrow then? Sure. All right, cool. Thank you. Are we running over our time, Taryn, moderator? You can go for about three more minutes before I'll need to cut you okay. off. Ruth and I will just start talking over you, Kathy. It's okay. I already kind of slow rolled, started to do to do that. Oh, you guys are up next, all right? I have to go to another meeting. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. We'll just talk about you. I'm used to it. Okay, if anybody needs a quick bathroom break or anything, um, we'll get started with the next session right at noon. And that's one that everybody always loves because it's all about the new features. Anybody has any final questions for this group? Please uh, turn on your audio and ask or ask in chat real quick. Quick comment. Best thing about getting involved in the community is this is a great group of people to work with. Really mm -hmm. do it for that reason alone, if nothing else. But don't do it on your own time. <laughs> if we're glad Unless you really Kathy love it back. and you want to stay up. <laughs> I feel like there's a bit of a pot kettle thing going on there, Kathy. I'm sorry. I mean, mm -hmm. it was. <laughs> what? Huh? About doing it on your own time? I mm. have been very good, of, much better than I used to be. Based on whose standard you're on, are you self evaluating? <laughs> we say this out of love and also recognition. <laughs> Make us cookies. I, I do make cookies on my own time. Andrea, you want to drive? Oh boy, didn't I crash a bunch last year? Sure, I'll drive. Well, it's cool. I'm there. I got cool. this. Cool.